This video will show all the steps in the restoration of this 1875 basalt and lock sewing machine. The idea is to provide a broader view of what's involved so anyone thinking of starting such a project knows what they're getting into. To keep it as short as possible, complicated steps will be described briefly with links to more detailed videos about them listed below. Let's get started. The first step is to get the machine sewing because there's no sense spending a hundred hours or more restoring it only to find out that it doesn't work. Start off by applying oil to all of the oil points above and below the bed. Try to give the main wheel a turn. If it does but feels sticky, keep turning it until the oil works into the bearings. 95% of the machines in our collection work fine after this. If the wheel still doesn't turn, apply more oil to all the oiling points and then to every moving, rotating, and sliding surface. Let the oil sit overnight to penetrate. By the morning, this usually will unstick the machine. It may also be necessary to remove the faceplate on the sewing head and soak all of the moving parts with oil inside it. Only two of the machines in our collection remain stuck after this. One required disassembly to remove corrosion that was locking things up, and the other had a bent arm that had to be straightened. Unfortunately, I can't provide any instruction on how to take antique sewing machines apart. Each machine has a unique design, making generalizations impossible. Each has to be examined to figure out how it works, what's wrong, and how to take it apart to fix it. In the case of this basalt and lock, there was a much more serious problem. It turned too easily. It was because many of the teeth on these two crown gears had gotten broken off. To fix this, I used baking soda and super glue to build up little mounds where each tooth was located, then filed it to shape. This actually worked better than any steel impregnated epoxy putty or epoxy mixture I tried. Once the machine's sewing, it's time to look for anything else that's wrong. For example, on this basalt and lock, it's missing a thread guide here, the bobbin winder is loose, its rubber wheel has fallen off, and most importantly, it's missing an external gear cover over these gears. Each antique sewing machine will have its own set of problems like these. The restorer has to be creative in figuring out how to fix each one. Many times this is the most frustrating part of a restoration because there simply aren't any repair manuals available. Let's start with the thread guide. Pictures from online sources show that this machine uses a hook guide in this location. Here's the hole it fits in. A good source for shiny wires to make these out of are binder clips. These come in many different sizes and thicknesses of wires, paper clips, and even drapery hooks. Find one that has a wire that fits into the hole very tightly. Cut a length off, bend it to shape, and press it in, just like that. This can also be used to make pigtail type thread guides. The bobbin winder turned out to be an interesting problem. I had thought that the issue was that the bolt was loose. It wasn't. It was locked in tight. I had to use a channel locks to actually unscrew this. You couldn't do it with a screwdriver. And what I found is evidently sometime in its past, the machine had been dropped and it landed on the bobbin winder and the shaft to the bolt had actually gotten bent. What I did is I forced it out, put it in the vise, straightened it out, and now it works great. This is a nice example showing that you never know what sorts of problems you're going to get into when you start a restoration or how you're going to solve them. As for the rubber ring for the bobbin winder so that uh, the wheel will turn it, uh, these are fairly easy to repair. Most sewing machine repair shops will have a selection of what look like O-rings that can be slipped on here. If they don't have anything, what you can do is go to a hardware store and look in the plumbing section for O-rings or also in the hardware section where you can find rubber grommets for uh, a wide range of uses in all different sizes. I actually find these tend to work the best because there's the greatest range of sizes and you're bound to find one that'll fit. Like this. It works great. 
If you can't find anything ready-made, you can even go on Amazon and buy quarter-inch rubber rope or cording. This can be cut to length, super glue the ends together, and you can make any size ring you want. Now let's tackle the missing gear cover. The best solution is to search eBay for the part. Also, sometimes sellers offer bundles of parts for certain machines. Unfortunately, these are usually hard to find, so most of the time, the only option is to make a replacement. Online images of this machine provided a good idea of what the gear cover looks like. I combined that with what the dimensions of the gears are and where it had to be attached to develop an idea for what it needed to look like. This I molded out of epoxy putty impregnated with steel. And this is the result. And here it is attached. I know it looks a little odd, but you put some black paint on it, some gold artwork, and it'll look great. This is not an ideal solution, but it's better than having a machine that's incomplete. I'm not going to kid you, it's a lot of work molding this, shaping it, grinding it down, and getting it finished. But in the end, the machine will be the better for it. One of the most common missing parts in antique sewing machines are the screws and bolts that hold it together. This creates a problem because many times they used unusual head shapes which you just can't find today. One way to replace these is to find a bolt that is, fits the uh, existing hole and threads and then grind the head to shape. To do this, I use what I call a poor man's lathe. It's just an electric drill mounted on a wood frame. You chuck the bolt into the drill, turn it on at a slow speed, and then use a Dremel tool to grind off the edges and shape the head to whatever you want. A hacksaw will cut the slot you need in it, and you can size almost any screw you need for the machine. Now that the machine is complete and turning over, it's time to make it sew. Since we're talking about an antique, it'll use a shuttle that moves back and forth. The shuttle has a bobbin in it that holds the bottom thread. Adjust the length of the needle so that its tip comes down just below the nose of the shuttle when the needle is all the way down. Thread the machine, place some fabric in it, and watch the needle and shuttle as the wheel is slowly rotated. The needle should bottom out and just start to move upward as the shuttle's nose passes over it. As the needle starts to move upward, it creates a loop of thread through which the shuttle will pass. Adjust the needle's length so that the loop is large enough for the shuttle to catch it. If the needle forms the loop too soon or too late for the shuttle to catch it, the timing is off. What probably happened is that the machine was taken apart and not put together properly. What has to be done is figure out how to move the upper and lower gear train separately and change their relative motions so that the shuttle can catch the loop. If the needle produces two lowest dips, the shuttle should be positioned to catch the loop between the two dips. Now that the machine is complete and working, we finally get to start on its cosmetic restoration. I like to begin by polishing the shiny metal parts. To do this, we're going to need to take the machine apart. And there we come to one of the most important steps of all. Before you take anything apart, take photos of it. Make a photographic record. And every time you take something off, exposing some of the inner workings, take pictures of that too. It's a nightmare trying to put one of these things together without a good photo record. We'll start by polishing some screw heads. Now these are more important than their small size suggests because the heads are usually curved. They catch and reflect light in many different angles, increasing the pop or the glitter of the machine as one walks around it. We'll start with the screw to the needle holder. It has just about everything wrong with it. A wire brush and an electric drill will help speed the initial cleaning. Start by cleaning out the slot after filing off any burrs. Then move to cleaning out the threads. This is more important than just making the screw easier to screw into its hole. Sometimes threads are exposed to view and clean threads look better. Place the screw in the electric drill and then start working it with micro mesh polishing cloths starting with 1500 grit and slowly working all the way to 12,000 mesh cloth. Small screws like this will take 10 to 15 minutes to bring to a brilliant shine. 
a well-polished screw head like this not only looks good, but it also slows the rate of corrosion. Let's move on to a more difficult object, something flat. The polishing process is pretty much the same for flat objects. A piece of rubber makes it easy to immobilize the piece while you work on it. The only difference is if they are heavily pitted, you may need to start with a much coarser sandpaper, maybe even 120, work your way up to 400, and then transition into the micro mesh, eventually getting to the 12,000. But it's all worth it because when you're done, you can take something that looks like this and make it look like that. And it makes all the difference in the world to the finished machine. Here's what all the parts look like after polishing. Using a metal polish like Autosol will both improve and preserve the shine. One useful tool is simply a half inch diameter dowel about four inches long with micro mesh rubber band to it. Uh, chucked into an electric drill and spun, this makes polishing oddly shaped pieces like the presser foot much easier. Another useful tool is a nut and bolt ground down as small in diameter as possible to hold the tensioning discs in place. Put in an electric drill and spun, you can easily polish this with micro mesh. This is more important than just uh, cosmetics because a smooth surface on the inside allows for more accurate and consistent tensioning adjustments. One final very useful item is something like lava soap. Polishing metal produces an enormous amount of very fine black soot that stains the hands. Believe me, you'll want something like this after you finish your machine. Antique sewing machines were almost always japanned. This is a thick, hard, tough layer of asphalt, turpentine, and linseed oil baked onto the cast iron bodies. Many times cleaning with a degreaser like 409 or Gojo, followed by polishing with Novus 2 fine scratch remover, brings the Japan finish back to a good shine, usually without damaging any decals. Always test your cleaning process by starting in an out of the way area that isn't easily seen from the front of the machine. I prefer the right rear corner. Apply some degreaser and work one small area at a time. Now it's probably going to be necessary to redo this at least three times to get all of the old built up oil and grease off of the surface. Once the machine is clean, we can start restoring the finish and artwork. For small chips in the Japaning, I found a gloss black enamel works the best. I like these little bottles from testers. To touch up small defects in the artwork, close-up glasses like these will help with the fine detailing. The closest match I've found to the color and luster of the original gold paints used on most antique sewing machines is Design Master's 14 karat gold. Spray a little of this in a cup and use a very fine brush to apply it. This is delicate work, so practicing beforehand is a good idea. Sadly, in the case of this basalt and lock, there is no remaining base finish or artwork, so we're going to have to start over from scratch. The first step is restoring the black base coat. Ideally, I'd like to re-Japan the entire machine, and I've done this before on other machines. What I found, though, is that it is a dangerous, tedious, time-consuming process that's easy to mess up. What I use now is gloss black spray enamel. After masking, apply several coats of a good gloss black enamel. I've had good luck with Rust-Oleum's Gloss Protective Enamel. Let it dry completely for at least two days so that when you start to handle it, it doesn't produce fingerprints. Once it's dry, we can start working on the artwork. The gear cover will serve to demonstrate the three application techniques I use. For surfaces with curves in two directions, which are difficult to cover with decals, stenciling works well. Cover the area with thin automotive masking tape, trace out the design, use an X-Acto knife to cut it out, then lay down a base coat of gold ink. This will fill in ink areas not covered by the gold leaf. 
Dab leafing adhesive over the stencil, then lightly pat any excess off. Use a leafing brush to transfer the leaf to the stencil and ponce it down with a dense brush. I prefer 24 karat gold leaf because it matches both the color and luster of the original bronze powder based paints originally used more than 150 years ago and better than any other paint I've found. After that, peel off the masking tape and clean up any problems with a gloss black enamel and a fine brush. For areas that only curve in one dimension or are flat, water slide decals provide the best looking results. But be warned, making a decal set for the average antique sewing machine takes around 40 hours and that's just the artwork. Have to add another 20 to print and apply them. Ready-made decals are available online for some machines, but these use metallic inks that don't have the same luster of true gold back decals. Some areas have such complicated shapes that they have to be free-handed. Dust the area with powdered sugar to prevent gold leaf from sticking where it's not wanted. Then, with a steady hand and a very finely tipped brush, lay down gold leaf adhesive in the desired pattern. Let it dry a minute, then cover with gold leaf. Ponce it down and brush the excess leaf and powdered sugar away. Gently washing with water and blow drying with air will finish it off. Repeat these steps as needed to redo all of the artwork on the rest of the machine. Follow that by clear coating the artwork, reassembling the machine, and you're done. Here we are back at the beginning before starting this restoration. And here's what she looks like now. The total restoration time was 135 hours spread out over two months. This was only the hands-on time working and doesn't include the time spent waiting for paint to cure or decals to set. All the artwork is historically correct for this machine. One of the surprises turned out to be how bright the enamel embellishments are, particularly the tiny red flowers. Their color was determined by carefully removing the yellowed and soiled shellac, covering them up on another basalt and lock in our collection, which revealed their true brilliance. I hope you enjoyed this detailed description of how to restore an antique sewing machine. I intend posting a follow-up video showing how to sew on this machine, but that's going to have to wait until I finish my current project, restoring a beautiful 1869 Grover & Baker. Thank you very much for watching.